Now that you've um, written some code to simulate this dynamical system, this two-dimensional dynamical system, and you can plot its numerical solutions in time, we're going to connect a little bit back to the theory that we started to develop at the end of the first tutorial. In particular, how is the solution of this system related to the eigen decomposition of our matrix A? Now, the astute among you have probably already noticed that this equation, even though it looks a lot like the equations we had in tutorial one, are slightly different. In particular, instead of specifying x dot, the derivative of x with respect to time, here we're actually using a to specify a map of what's happening from every time k to the next time step k plus 1. This little difference is worth a little bit more digging into because they are actually closely related in a very sensible way, but they are different descriptions of similar systems. Um, you'll see a lot of equations and different models being written either in one notation or the other, so it's worth spending a little bit of time digesting it and figuring out how to interpret the matrix A in either of these cases. What they have in common is that these are all dynamical systems. In, in other case, you have an A matrix that tells you something about how the system evolves in time. The continuous time formulation is written in terms of x dot, and the discrete time formulation is written in terms of a map. Now what this means is that the continuous time formulation tells you something about the flow and the direction. There's a vector of how things change at that particular time. And if you write it down, if you remember from calculus, the definition of this, um, of this derivative is actually defined in terms of a limit as the time step dt gets really, really small and the limit in dt approaches zero of something that is a discrete difference. In the discrete time formulation, conversely, instead of having that limit, we're just going to take a discrete non-zero delta t, and the A matrix now specifies how do I jump from one time k to the next time k plus 1. Okay, So the interpretation of A here is a little bit different, so it's really important to keep track of which of these formulation a particular model is written as. Now the simplest thing to interpret when you're looking at these formulation is by looking at the stable solution, in other case, when things don't change. In the continuous time formulation, things don't change when x dot equals 0, and that only happens when a equals 0. In the discrete time formulation, instead, things don't change when x k plus 1 equals x k, and that's true when a equals 1. So even though these two formulations are related, the stable solution lives in a very different place. Let's dig into that a little bit more. When we're looking at uh, the eigenvalues of A, which determines the stability of the discrete time formulation x dot equals ax, what we introduced in tutorial one is that there's is, if you plot the, the eigenvalue spectrum of A, you can separate it into growing, decaying, or stable with oscillations, frequencies of oscillation on the imaginary axis. If you are looking at the discrete time formulation and the eigenvalue spectrum of A in the discrete time formulation, things look a little bit different. Instead of looking at the left half plane or the right half plane, we're actually looking at whether inside or outside the unit circle, where the unit circle is where the eigenvalue has a radius of 1 and things are totally stable on the unit circle. Everything inside the unit circle is going to be decaying, everything outside the unit circle is going to be growing. Now, these two eigenvalue spectra are actually related to each other by a logarithm operation, where you scale it by delta t, whatever the units of delta t are. In the continuous time formulation, b is proportional to the frequency. And if you take the logarithm of that, what you'll discover is that the angle of the eigenvalue in this bottom formulation, this angle phi here, is proportional to the frequency of oscillation. So that's how those two are related. If we go back to our probabilistic model of closing and opening uh, ion channels and take the eigen decomposition of this A matrix here, what you're going to get are, because this is a two by two system, you're going to get two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors. Okay? Your goal is to discover which of these eigenvalues corresponds to the stable solution. In other words, the one that equals 1. And if you look at the corresponding eigenvector, that tells you something about the direction in which the solution is stable. So what you're going to do is take the eigen decomposition of A and identify which one is a stable solution and look at its corresponding eigenvector. And you're going to, you're going to compare 
this eigenvector to the equilibrium numerical solution that developed in exercise 2b.